Right, well, thank you very much for coming. Um, I don't know anything about food, so my thing's not going to be on food at all, but what I am going to do is to set up a bit of a framework for Alice's doctoral research, which is very, very much focused around food. So I do stuff around corporates and corporate environmentalism, so I'm going to start with that as a lead-in for um, a way of looking at this in an, in an alternative way, which is what Alice's work does. So I want to start with this really quite lovely quote, I think, which was, it's an unnamed participant, but it was at a workshop on global economics at the World Women's Congress for, for, the, for a Healthy Planet, way back in 1991. And I think what it does is it points up the importance of things like um, emotion, um, care, compassion, even love things that are missing very much, as we'll see, from the discourses of corporate environmentalism. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start by talking a bit about corporate environmentalism and sort of what's wrong with it, and I'm going to demonstrate how it's underpinned by neoliberal imperatives, but also say that actually in its own terms it's not, it's not actually immoral, but what we need is a different kind of moral logic. So that's what um, an ethics of care is all about. And I'm going to then talk about an eco-feminist, care-sensitive ethics, and an ethics which is embodied. Um, and the reason I like this quote is because it talks about weeping. And weeping is a very embodied reaction to something, um, and then do something. So how an emotional, embodied reaction actually leads on to action, actual practical action. Right, so what's corporate environmentalism? Well, Banerjee, who was a bit of a hero of mine, way back in 2002 defined it like this, organisation-wide recognition, legitimacy and importance of biophysical environment, formulation of organisation strategy, integration of environmental issues into the strategic planning process, which all sounds a bit kind of fine and dandy, but actually it isn't because the way that the environment is taken um, into account in decision-making processes is very, very much focused in corporates on the business case. So even right from when um, the environment and things like that started to rise up uh, the agenda of, of corporations, mainly because of um, pressure from publics, pressure from regulation, right from the beginning of all of that, it has always been framed as how can we get competitive advantage out of this? You know, what are, how can we see this as both a challenge but an opportunity? You know, so we won't do anything unless we can see that there's some win in it for us, you know, some gain for our shareholders. So the economic bottom line has always been paramount. So you have things like uh, back in 1995, um, I don't know if any of you are into management and organisation studies, but there's a thing called the natural resource-based view, which uh, was promulgated by a guy called Hart, and that really set the tone for how, you know, nature is seen as a resource for corporations, not as something that's important in its own right. So corporations frame the issue, actually there is a food reference there, um, in terms of technological innovation and eco-efficiency. So this is actually um, Ginster's Pasties. So Ginster's Pasties are based in North Devon, and what they do is they take uh, the waste from their pasty-making operations, which is all a bit kind of gruesome to think of. I always think of the waste going into the pasty, but, <laughs> but they put it into an anaerobic digester, and it produces um, methane, which then um, is fired, and it's produces electricity, which then goes to um, run some of Ginster's Pasties operations. So it's that sort of technological innovation. And eco-efficiency, doing more with less. So um, we have this at Bristol, and I'm sure you have it here too. You know, we are, uh, yes, you have, the recycling bins. You know, we're very much encouraged to put the paper in one and the tins in the other. And the, the university looks at ways for us to reduce, say, transport costs and, and that sort of thing. So doing more with less. The second uh, framing is in terms of um, opportunities for growth. So this is the We Mean Business Coalition. And you can see here it's economic opportunity through bold climate action. And you've also got something called the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, 
which is around two or 300 chief executives of big companies we've all heard of, like Rio Tinto and PricewaterhouseCoopers, who, um, who specifically say that they are looking for growth opportunities. They've got, like, they brought out a report in 2006, which was all about, you know, let's not see it as a challenge, let's see it as an opportunity. Um, they're not talking so much about the environment in this particular uh, bit, but they're talking about people living in poverty in different parts of the world, and they talk about them as potential consumers, employees, and suppliers. And their little strap line is, the products are the purpose, the profits are the prize. And the third way of looking at this is very much in terms of um, expanding the role of the market. So, um, you know, all those uh, little exhortations on plastic bottles to us to recycle them, um, to buy the washing machine that is A-rated for the environment instead of something lower. Um, greener products in response to uh, consumer demand. So things like, I don't know, organic meat, which doesn't really question the whole idea of eating meat in the first place, but I guess if we've got to do it, it might as well be organic. And monetizing resources, and the most obvious example of that is things like carbon trading, but also stuff like ecotourism, you know? So you've got some beautiful, unspoilt part of the world, and uh, you, know, you turn it into a resource. So these are just some examples of the ways that uh, corporations engage with the environment. And as I said, it's all very much around you know, the market and responding to the market. And I would argue that it kind of promotes a, a simulacrum of sustainability. It's sort of like we do our little bit. You know, we're putting our tins here and our waste paper there, but actually it's lulling us into this sort of complacency around the really actually quite more radical things that we need to do. And in fact, Boltansky and Chiapallo in their... Uh, monumental tome, The Spirit of Capitalism, actually pointed to these kind of green or greener initiatives um, as a way of reviving capitalism. They said cons consumer capitalism was running into the buffers and this, these sorts of initiatives were ways of reinvigorating it when markets had reached, reached saturation point. So, Corporate environmentalism is very, very much linked to ideas about neoliberalism. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry if this is all stuff you already know, but neoliberalism is all around the interests of society being best served by individual maximization of self-interest. That's most effectively achieved through the operation of the market and through the devolution of regulatory authority. So, under neoliberalism, the role of the state is very much... Um, it's rolled back, but it's focused. It's not that it doesn't do anything. It's focused on ensuring that the state uh, is reduced in size so that these things can all sort of happen. The prevailing conditions, if you like, are conducive for deregulation, expansion of markets, and the privatization of assets. But it's not without um, its own moral logic. So Botansky and Chiapello again, they talk about how um, capitalism and neoliberalist, neoliberalist capitalism in particular um, are detached from the moral sphere. So what it does is it tries to seek moral legitimation for itself. And the way it does that is by saying that this pursuit of individual interest actually serves the common good. So the moral costs of us all being selfish consumers are, um, are offset by the increased material and other goods that have come about because of it. So it's not really so much about um, capital just reaping the rewards of capitalism. Um, it has actually provided benefits to us all, well, at least to some of us and at least in the global north. It also talks very much around how it counters threats to individual rights and freedom from state intervention. So the collective wealth that has been produced through capitalism um, has been um, uh, argued by people like um, Foucault, for example, in his ideas about governmentality, um, that, 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 sort of, that, has, that has actually legitimated um, the way that capitalism works. So it's legitimated by economic growth and prosperity. And all of this sort of adds up to assume some kind of personal connection between being a moral, responsible individual and an economic, rational actor. So 
the being the person who pursues material advantage, personal material advantage, rationally assessing the costs and benefits of all of this, expressing our free will and all of that kind of stuff, and taking responsibility for ourselves. That's all part of this kind of moral logic of neoliberalism. Now, in terms of the environment, um, it's been argued by uh, people like Castry that for the last 30 years, um, nature has been increasingly subject to neoliberalizing practices. And for some, there are claims that you know, neoliberal, neoliberalist um, practices will provide ways of finding stewardship of the environment. So this is summed up by something called ecological modernism. So nature gets uh, in increasingly incorporated into the orbit of capital accumulation and neoliberalism um, actually promotes technological innovation. So through, it doesn't rely on state protection, it's the privatization and marketization of the natural world, very similar as we've seen in corporate um, environmentalism, through things like technological innovation, so uh, things like, say, from little things to, say, the Ginster's pasty digester, right up to big plans for geoengineering and carbon scrubbing and that sort of thing, and macroeconomic restructuring. So macroeconomic restructuring is the sort of supposed decoupling of production from, or growth from production of things, so that we have, for example, um, we have nowadays, if you think, 20 years ago, a computer would have filled this room. Nowadays, there's probably more computing power on our phones than there were on computers of that time. The problem is, of course, is that all those years ago, there were probably only five giant computers in the world, and now everybody's got a smartphone. So it kind of, you, it's very difficult to decouple um, growth from actual production. Some people claim it's happening. Lots of people are more, are more uh, cynical about it. So it's clearly linked in the same way that corporate environmentalism is to these sort of market-based solutions, innovation through technology, and win-win eco-efficiencies. The problem is it hasn't worked. So it has meant that some people have, you know, their capital in accumulation has been enhanced, other people have been left behind. Um, in fact, and that gap is growing, you know, the gap between the rich and the poor. So minimal mitigation of environmental damage, increasing flows of assets, wealth and income to, to elites. Um, the trouble is that things like, you know, Berman or well, et al.'s work on carbon trading, extension of power by capital, empowerment of dominant countries and elite groups, and an exacerbation of global inequalities. And certainly the European... Um, carbon trading scheme has really not resulted in one drop of carbon actually being saved. Um, and in other places, like Ecuador, have got a scheme absolutely floundering amongst fraud and all kinds of stuff. So, th so that kind of monetizing of the environment just hasn't worked. And even supporters of ecological modernization can see um, problems. So, for example, there is no... There is no technical fix. There is no market solution to cutting down a rainforest. Once you've lost it, it's gone. There's nothing like that for, for replacing species that get wiped out. Once it's lost, that's it, it's gone. Powerful vested interests resist it. Um, well, I, I mean, there's just countless examples of that. I just, well, where do you begin? Um, Gains in eco-efficiency are neutralised by growth. So that's like my example of, um, you know, the giant room-sized computer and the smartphone. So, or there's uh, other evidence that shows that, you know, if you make cars more fuel efficient, actually people drive more in them. So, stuff like that. And, of course, there are criti critics who say that all of this is just a kind of political strategy. So that... Um, so that it will accommodate critique of neoliberalism, but it actually doesn't make much of a difference. And I think George Monbiot, the ecological or environmental campaigner, sums it up really rather nicely. He talks about nature is just natural capital. Ecological processes are ecosystem services because they're just there to serve us. 
hills, forests and rivers, green infrastructure, wildlife and habitats, asset classes in an ecosystems market, fish populations, stocks, because they only exist as uh, movable assets from which wealth can be extracted. So basically, corporate environmentalism and the ecological kind of modernism with which it's allied um, have, been, have proved to be rubbish as stewards. They don't protect the environment at all. And what we're doing is we're continuing to rip up the fabric of the planet which supports our life upon it. Um, and one of the reasons it's failed is that because the common good places the interest of some humans above some others, and inevitably, the interests of humans are placed above the interests of the environment. So the environment is not given any kind of inherent value. It's not, it's not valued for itself. It's only valued in terms of how it can serve, I won't even say us, how it can serve you know, this kind of stuff. So things like uh, degradation of the living world, climate change, all of those things are happening. And I've, um, the World Wildlife Fund in 2014 came out with an absolutely horrific, horrific survey that showed that between uh, 1970 and 2010, over half the world's animals have been lost. So that's not half of species, but a count up of invertebrate animals. I mean, in 1970, I was only 15. This has happened within my lifetime. But we have got less than half the animals on the planet than we had you know, 40, 50 years ago, which is shocking and scary. And this is set to continue unless we do something about it. So what, we are, what I'm arguing is that we need a different kind of moral response. And I'm saying that um, we will find that perhaps in ecofeminist care ethics, because the business case, that kind of argument isn't working. The moral logic of neoliberalism isn't working. So we need something alternative to that. So um, I'm, I'm going to sort of talk about ecofeminism really, really briefly. Um, and ecofeminism, there isn't an ecofeminism. There are lots and lots of different perspectives on ecofeminism. But the thing that most ecofeminists have in co common is that um, the systems which um, justify colonialism, racism, ableism, as well as sexism, and the subordination of, the, uh, subordination of nature, it's, it's the same system. So it's the same system that is um, producing all these different kinds of uh, forms of oppression. And they're interrelated and they're cross-cutting, and you can't address them by just picking one or the other. It's something that has to be done together. So it's a, something that's systemic. And this is um, Val Plumwood, who talks about how the account, so this is the account of the patriarchal system, uh, draws on the familiar view of reason and emotion as separated and opposed. So there's this kind of binary opposition between reason and emotion. So things like desire, care, love, they are just personal and particular, whereas and they're opposed to universality and impartiality of understanding, and feminine emotions are cast as being unreliable, untrustworthy, and morally irrelevant, and an inferior domain to be dominated by a superior, disinterested, and, of course, masculine reason. So the kind of genuine human that uh, is somebody who is not emotional, not associated with the body, um, and they are objective. So all this kind of messy stuff around desire, care, and love is something that is... Um, denigrated and ignored. But what ecofeminism, um, something that it finds very important, is a commitment to transformative change. So it's all about striving to find a means to move from life-denying systems and relationships to life-affirming ones. So that's a really important part of ecofeminism, is that it's not just critique, it's about action and doing stuff. So an ecofeminist ethics of care, um, it grows from the ethics of care that was, uh, well, originally, I guess, uh, proposed by people like Carol Gilligan and Nell Noddings, but has moved on 
enormously from that and, and really draws far more from the kind of Joan Tronto ethics of care, which is about seeing care not as being something to do with mothers and children and not necessarily about being something that's personal and between individuals, but about seeing it as a political and social imperative. Um, but it is grounded in regard for um, feelings, needs and desires of all nature, which includes human beings. So it's an understanding of, of life, wherein it's not only humans have these feelings, needs and desires, and it's not about trying to impose rights and rules and obligations or abstract principles. It's very much about self and relationship with the rest of the world. So that's with um, human beings and with what I would call the more than human, which is a term borrowed from geography, which doesn't sort of set humans and more, hu more than human up in opposition. It's very much about how we are also part of the more than human. We're all part of nature. <coughs> so it's around a capacity to care and to see those kinds of interconnections um, to others that include um, the non-human. So, and the more than human includes us, but it's not necessarily equal in terms of rights, and it's not based on notions around um, sens sentience or stuff like that, which a lot of the animal liberation stuff is around. It's, um, it's more about the messy stuff around care. It also sees that care and justice are very much intertwined. It doesn't see them as being exclusive, which some care ethicists do. Um, what they're talking about is how care will lead to justice for a more just world. So it's very, and it's also very much about context. So making decisions, deciding what kind of care principles to use, what kind of practices to follow, very much in the context in which those things happen. It's also um, an eco-centric philosophy. So it incorporates care and respect for the fundamental connectedness of all life. And it doesn't see humans as being separate from nature. It gives all an inherent value, but it, it, it respects the boundaries of the other. So it doesn't see sort of everything as this big undifferentiated mass. It says in order to care for things, there have to be, you know, we have to have the boundaries of the self. We have to have the boundaries of the other. We have to recognize and accept the other's difference. So it's about connection, but connected, but different. Where the embodied care part comes in is, it, is around challenging disconnect, disconnection. Because um, what Claire Colebrook has said is that uh, you know, we have become, particularly in the Global North, we've become really disconnected from the environment. We sit in air-conditioned offices, we ride on the tube, we drive in cars. You know, we don't feel the weather, we don't feel the climate changing. And that is uh, one of the reasons for, she argues, for the sort of lack of any kind of apparent panic around things like climate change. You know, it won't be until we feel the sun on the back of our necks and the waters lapping up around our ankles that we'll actually really start to begin to worry about it. So it's about, as uh, Naimanis and Walker say, about recognizing the fleshy, damp immediacy of our own embodied experiences. So really kind of connecting the imaginary to the corporeal, um, connecting the fact that we are also of nature and our vulnerability comes from our kind of corporeality, our organic beingness in the world, in the same way that nature's does. So that if we can open ourselves to that, if we can recognize our own vulnerability, we'll maybe stand a bit of a chance to do something around the kind of things that are happening. So as part of all this, you know, we really need to reaffirm the kind of really visceral sensations and emotions which we experience actually through our bodies. And we need to do that to develop these kind of effective caring engagements with um, and um, a sense of our embodied knowledge of the world. So the body and embodied experience, learning imagination, learning and imagination, those are the sorts of things that will empower us to develop care practices and motivate political action. And I'll give you an, ex I'll give you an example of this. I, um, in the introduction, it was said how I was a member of Froome Anti-Fracking, which I am, 
and I'm very, very opposed to fracking, but I've got even more opposed to fracking since I found out that the bit of land between my town and the one next to me, four nice blocks have been sold off to some energy company to frack. Now, these are fields that I walk in. I've lived in Froome for 35 years. I know the place like the back of my hand. These are fields that I walk in. I know the river that runs through it. I took my children there to play when they were children. So I've got a really embodied connection to this land that I love and that could be covered you know, in fracking rigs. Horrible. But that kind of embodied um, experience that I have, um, that kind of makes fracking concrete for me. Now, I cared about it before. I care about it even more now. So it actually makes something material, makes it real, makes it concrete. Um, but this embodied capacity for care, as I said, you know, a lot of my experience of these fields is very physical, embodied experience. But that embodied capacity for care, in my case, I was worried about fracking before. A lot of people partic didn't particularly know anything about it. But it's moved me and others from the particular to the general. Because other people, as they've heard about what might be happening in these fields, and they learn more about fracking, they learn about you know, why, what's happening politically with the government saying that you know, we're going to ignore what local councils want, it's going to be up to us to decide. So they have become very much more politically aware of what's going on. They've become much more aware of the environmental consequences of fracking. So now we have you know, a busload of people going from Froome who are not the kind of people who would generally turn out and go on a demonstration, but a busload of people going from Froome up to the North Yorkshire Moors, where I think Friday there's going to be a decision about whether fracking is taking place on the North Yorkshire Moors. So this is, this is a really good example of how caring for the particular has led to caring for the more general. I'd also say that, you know, my experience and others, this, this love, this embodied love for the area that we live in has extended, you know, it's not, it's not just rational, is it? It's a responsive emotional engagement with nature, which for Trish Glazebrook, she says this kind of thing can't be fully articulated according to the demands of objectivity. You know, it's responsive to the physical environment in which it's practised. So it's a matter of um, that different kind of knowing and meaning joined up with, because I'm not saying that the objective kind of knowing and meaning is wrong, far from it, but joining those two things together so that we have uh, this responsible emotional engagement with nature which leads to action. I'm also going to argue that its, um, it's indirect experiences also challenge us to engage differently and see the familiar from a radical perspective. So I've actually done quite a lot of work with artists and, a, and an eco-poet in particular. Um, so around how more vicarious experience can help us to imagine um, the impacts of some of these things, the impacts on communities and the impacts on particular sorts of animals. Um, and if you listen to, I don't know, let's say the archers, which is a, a really good example of how people have got really carried away around, I don't know if you listen to the archers, Helen Titchmarsh and her um, coercive control by her husband, she's ended up stabbing him and being in prison, and the archers' listenership has like, and it's because that kind of vicarious experience of understanding what people who are different to us, distant from us, are going through. And art can do that as well. So uh, my friend Susan Richardson's poetry and people like Neville Gaby's installations, um, you know, they, they help us to engage with things and see, see the familiar from a very radical perspective. But again, all of those things are embodied, emotional, visceral things. It's not rationality. It's not facts and figures and ob sort of objective things. It's things which get to us in here and not so much up there. And we can use that kind of imagination to reach out from, um, you know, reach out over the limitations, if you like, of space and geography and time. You know, we, we care about refugees. We care about the orangutans in the jungles of Indonesia. These are not things that are necessarily parts of our everyday lives, 
but that feeling and that imagination combines in order for us to do something about it. So, um, I also see very much care as being a form of resistance. So this is the lovely Bev Skeggs, and she's talking, actually she's not talking about things to do with the environment. She was doing research on um, mining, old mining communities, but it was also around this kind of care. You know, anti-cruelty, anti-greed, in opposition to the logic of capital, against an instrumental dog-eat-dog -dog world. And Val Plumwood, again, you know, care being seen as an attempt to obtain a new human and social identity in relation to, to nature, which I think is what we need to start to begin to do. Um, Recognising and accommodating these relationships, which we deny at the moment, of dependency, um, enabling us to acknowledge our debt to the sustaining others of the world. So it's around, you know, a caring, ecological self, very much in relationship. So, I mean, I see care very much as a starting point. So it's a place from where to begin to build these more kind of meaningful and moral relations with nature, a kind of alternative way of being. And for sure, it's not going to provide us with neat solutions, and it will be um, in conflicting and ambiguous. Um, but I'm just going to end with a quote from the environmentalist Inestra King, because I see she's fallen off the end of the thing there, which is to say, it's a practice of hope. And to have hope is to believe that the future can be created by intentional human beings who now take responsibility for it. So I see care as being very much um, a resource on which to draw against the kind of hopelessness and disenchantment and alienation that I've been talking about. And we have to have hope. Hope, you know, hope is empowering. What is more disempowering than being hopeless? So I believe that a focus on care and embodied care will enable us to do that. It will give us a hope, a hope that we can change things and a hope that things that can be better. Thank you. So, yes, the idea is, as part of our uh, double act, is that I'll, um, in my presentation, um, look at some of the kind of themes and aspects of an eco-feminist ethic of care that Mary spoke about um, in the context of a community kitchen that I've been doing um, my research with. So, yes, you've I'm, I'm based at the University of Bristol, also in the Department of Management with Mary. Um, so I just thought I'd start by, this is the kind of leading question for my uh, PhD inquiry. So how can an eco-feminist ethic of care provide a resource through which to understand the ethico-political practices of a community kitchen? So in the first part, I want to just kind of set a context and talk a little bit about the community kitchen and, and give some background information. Um, I then want to speak a little bit about my research and the, a little bit about the role of participatory action research um, and what I believe to be a really fundamental connection to ecofeminism. Um, and then in the second part, I'm going to kind of explore um, kind of how embodied care practices emerge in the context of the community kitchen. Okay, uh, so the community kitchen. So um, it was started. Um, it was started by a group of environmental activists in the late 2000s with the aim of addressing food poverty, fuel poverty, poverty social isolation, and food waste. Um, and at the, uh, at the community kitchen, there's a group of volunteers uh, who cook a community meal once a week um, in a community centre in a city um, based in the south, uh, using collected uh, surplus food from supermarkets and local shops. Um, and the, me the meal is free and it's open to everyone. It takes place once a week and it's often attended by people living in vulnerable housing situations, people living with addiction issues, uh, people who've been affected particularly by kind of... Uh, welfare and benefit, benefit cuts more recently, um, and also refugee and asylum seekers. So there's, there's quite a few kind of refugee organisations in the, in the neighbourhood. Um, and it's also attended by um, people from the neighbouring community as well. Um, so in the past, they've also had a, a kind of vegetable and herb growing patch in, in the community centre that, that's kind of used to supplement the surplus food that they pick up. Um, and uh, on another note, the community kitchen is also involved in and caters for um, other kind of food waste and educational events around the city, um, particularly kind of events in schools. They run workshops uh, with children. They've also been involved in um, various local farms, um, various kind of local community um, activities, 
and they also run um, a kind of pop-up surplus food cafe as well, where members of the public are invited and they uh, pay a small fee um, to eat a kind of uh, a three-course um, surplus uh, food meal. Um, and importantly for my research, the community kitchen um, is now part of a kind of uh, a larger um, charity that has a network of community kitchens across the UK. Okay, so I thought I'd just give you some kind of visual images to give you a taste of kind of, of, of what happened. So these were taken on the um, rounds of collection. So the food picked up from local stores and supermarkets is collected with bikes and trailers. Um, and you can see there's a variety of, of different, we get um, kind of lots of bread from supermarkets. These are boxes from local stores. And then we also just generally see um, food that's kind of wasted, thrown in, in, in skips as well on, on our way. Um, so this is a, a picture from one of our community meals. Um, and this is me here stirring, I think it was a big pot of curry. Um, and this connects to my kind of research approach, um, which is uh, based on a kind of um, participatory action research approach. Um, so I've spent a lot of time um, doing a participatory action research project, so spending a lot of time kind of volunteering in the different positions in the kitchen um, and doing the cycling rounds and also various kind of educational activities as well. Um, so just to say very briefly a little bit about participatory action research, so it's a participatory and democratic approach to social science research. Um, that involves kind of building a collaborative relationship um, with the community that you're researching with um, and fundamentally is underpinned by the idea of kind of creating meaningful social change. Um, but um, it's also, it's, it also has a kind of environmental justice focus as well as a kind of social focus. Um, so Mary Bryden Miller and Ann Inger um, point out that it also involves promoting environmental justice and acknowledging the relationship between humans and nature and um, Bradbury and Reason say the goal of action research is to contribute to the increased well-being, economic, political, psychological, spiritual of human persons and the wider ecology of the planet of which we are an intrinsic part. Um, and so thinking about ecofeminism, as, as Mary mentioned earlier, ecofeminism is, um, is kind of deconstructive and seeks to understand different forms of oppression and domination. Um, but it's also reconstructive, and it's reconstructive through its links to political activism um, and also through um, the way it puts forward this kind of alternative ethic of care. So that kind of link to kind of political action very much tallies with participatory action research, I believe. Um, and I don't really have time to, to talk too much about my methods, but just very briefly, the kind of main method I've used is the learning history method. Um, which is a narrative <laughs> approach to action research that involves kind of collaboratively building um, kind of narrative documents um, based on particular issues that have arisen in, in the community or organisation's past. Um, and in the context of my research, I've kind of used these um, narrative um, documents to uh, begin a kind of process of discussion between the local community kitchen and the national charity around some of the kind of tensions and challenges that have emerged between those groups. Okay, so um, getting to uh, the juicy bit, um, the kind of looking at how ecofeminist ethics of care emerge in, in the community kitchen. So I'm, I'm going to kind of draw on um, the kind of theory um, that Mary has spoken about and, and give some examples from um, quotes from my interviews and workshops. Okay, uh, so the first quote is from Robert, who is a kind of founding member of the Community Kitchen. Um, and in describing the kind of main kind of aims and ambitions, he says it's about creating a culture and community around food. There was a diverse bunch of people involved. The things that unified us all would have been a passion for food and a good food system that nourishes both the environment and people that eat it. There was a big focus on food supply and food production and what that means in thinking about re-envisaging that. There was a kind of common consensus for a model of food generally that was less focused on large production and capital gain and more focused on looking after the land. A sustainable system, a system that is beneficial to everyone. So you can see these kind of links um, between kind of social and environmental justice. Um, and also, I think most importantly about this quote, and the reason why I picked it out, is because he talks about this culture and community around food, which is something that came up an awful lot in the kind of workshops and interviews. Um, so this is kind of premised on the desire to foster a kind of network of caring relations around food and, and food provisioning. 
um, and motivated fundamentally by a concern um, for the health and well-being of people and nature. And so volunteers often spoke about how they saw the community kitchen practices as a kind of response to issues of food and fuel poverty, um, particularly recently um, issues around austerity um, and welfare cuts and kind of growing isolation and atomization of society. And also obviously the environmental issue of food waste as well. Um, so this kind of culture and community around food was kind of acting to create human and, and, and planetary flourishing and making a kind of that commitment to transformative change when he's talking about the system at the end. Okay, um, so as part of this kind of culture and community around food, um, the people I interviewed, um, so sorry, I should have said that I've interviewed... Um, different stakeholders involved in the community group. So not just volunteers, um, also guests and people involved in the community centre as well. And so lots of the people I spoke to um, talked about the kind of community kitchen space as being central to kind of building this community around food and kind of fostering interconnection and relationship between different groups to kind of build a network or web of kind of caring relations around food and, and food provisioning. Um, so people spoke about the kind of uh, relationships forged between volunteers and guests, relationship with the local community centre. So for example, sometimes the community kitchen um, caters for various events going on at the community centre. Um, and also, um, they also spoke about the importance of being part of a larger network of community kitchens and knowing that there were other kitchens, even if they didn't physically um, meet the people there, um, that were doing the same thing and fighting against the same kind of social environmental justice goals. Um, so yes, it kind of became about kind of building and sustaining and nourishing networks and communities around food in that geographical area and also kind of further afield. Um, so I just wanted to just look at a few quotes here, particularly around the relationship um, between guests and volunteers. Um, so Anna says, there was this one guy who was, and Anna is a volunteer, there was this one guy who was like, oh, your bike is broken, and he went and fixed up my bike for me. So she's talking about um, one of the guests here. So you start to get quite attached to the people you see every week, which is a really big part of it. Like, we are not just a restaurant when we're, where we are just like, right, here is your food. It's about building relationships as well as just providing a meal. And then this kind of building relationships was also a, um, a theme that um, uh, kind of arose in lots of conversations that I had with guests as well. Um, so Tom, describing the environment of the community meal, said, it's not just I'm here, be grateful, you know. It's like you are human beings and you are part of something. You know, it's not just like, here, let me fill up your plate. It's talking to people and making them feel welcome. I think maybe it could mean a hell of a lot, of a hell of a lot to people other than just having food. It's taking care of them. It's not just taking care of your food needs. It's also about humanising people. Okay, and then finally... Um, Philip, and I chose this quote, um, Philip is a volunteer, um, because another kind of key theme was this kind of <coughs> overriding principle of, the, of, um, um, of inclusivity, and that really kind of defining the community space. So a lot of both volunteers and guests spoke about this, um, and the idea that of the community kitchen and the eating areas being an inclusive space, um, that kind of was outside of the rest of society that was, um, or different parts of society and social spaces that are often kind of defined by their exclusivity. Um, so Philip says, so when the meal was being served, we would kind of say, everyone out of the kitchen now, and we would have one person in there who was the manager for the day. We wanted it to be, you know, there is no reason why we should have people in the kitchen eating separately from everyone else. We should all be there having a meal together. There was sort of a deep-rooted sense that the meal should be enjoyed together, and that was really the glue that bound the whole thing together. Okay, so this brings me to um, the kind of um, embodied dimension of care, which came through very much in, in, in my research. Um, and particularly the role of kind of food, food provisioning, food activities, preparing food, eating together, sharing a meal, as that being a kind of inherently embodied activity, it's kind of visceral and, and, and material. Um, so Sarah says, uh, so when you're kind of cooking together, you're in the kitchen together, it's about sharing really, it's about all mucking in and all sharing and creating something, and creating something as a team is always a really, really wonderful thing. 
And when it all comes together at the end, it's like, oh, wow, this is great. We made this. And then when it comes to kind of sharing the meal with people, it's just, it's definitely a really good ice, icebreaker. Because can you imagine, right, get a group of people, some know each other, some maybe don't, and say, okay, everyone, everyone sit around 10 tables and talk, and talk. Would anyone find that fun? But by having a plate of food in front of you, it means that, yeah, you're kind of, you're immediately sharing something. You've got something in common. It puts everyone on a level playing field. It means that if you're not necessarily sure what to chat about, you've always got something to chat about. You can just chat about the food and whether you like it and whether it's a bit too spicy. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, I guess it's because eating is something that we all need to do. It's so basic. And I think maybe its beauty is in the fact that it's very basic. It's not something that people um, should need to choose to do. Some people do have to choose whether to feed themselves or their children or whatever, which shouldn't happen. But yes, we all need food to survive. And I think here at the end, um, she kind of picks out this kind of shared commonality in needing to kind of nourish ourselves and also the shared kind of vulnerability around food and how that kind of shared vulnerability is, is central to kind of fostering uh, relations and understanding one another. Um, okay, so I wanted to talk about some of the kind of uh, challenges and tensions in involved um, in carrying out these kind of care practices in the kitchen. Um, and many different things came up and I, I, I was kind of trying to decide um, uh, which to talk about. Um, so obviously uh, care, was, care was something that was kind of constantly negotiated and contested, which I think Mary spoke about, um, kind of according to the day-to-day -day experiences in the community kitchen and the particular kind of context that arose. Um, and there, uh, lots of people spoke about the kind of challenges of, of bringing together a diverse uh, group of people from different fr backgrounds, etc. Um, but what I wanted to focus on here um, is the kind of challenges and tensions, because this was kind of a central part of my research, um, around being part, or the community kitchen, being part of a kind of larger professional charity. Um, and at times, the kind of, um, kind of more professional, rational approach um, of uh, the larger charity was kind of uh, at odds with the experiences of um, some of the local volunteers. So I wanted to read this to demonstrate, to read this quote from Hannah. So she's reflecting on her experiences attending a kind of workshop conference that was run by the uh, central charity. Um, so she says one, one guy, referring to somebody within the charity, called the people that come to the community meal. What did he call them? He called them clients, which is just gross. It's like, what? There are such barriers. I just thought there was this really big barrier between the central organisation and us. I don't know what I would call the people that come, even service users is so clinical. It was just very depersonalizing, I think. I just felt none of it has like, you can't quantify this, but when I have to think about it, I just feel like there was no heart in what was said. It was very lacking in care. And very, I thought it was very aimed towards marketing the brand, you know. This is our charity brand, and this is how you sell the brand into your communities. I mean, that is sort of what we are trying to do, get more people to come but what a way to look at it. I just shut down from it and I couldn't relate to it. So you can kind of see, um, uh, for me, what this quote represents is that um, Hannah wants to uh, uh, kind of respond on a kind of emotional, um, connected uh, level in the context of the community kitchen and this kind of professional, more rational and kind of less embodied approach um, from the central charity was, was kind of problematic. And she says at the end that she couldn't relate to it and she shut down from it. OK, so I, I also wanted to talk a little bit um, about the, um, this kind of theme that er emerged around seeing the bigger picture. And it, it kind of connects to what Mary was saying, really, about the kind of local and particular um, this relationship between understanding the local um, particular and concerns that you have at the kind of local contextual level and that um, being part of your understanding or leading to greater understanding of the uh, kind of general bigger picture systemic issues and the kind of relationship vice versa between these two elements. Um, so volunteers spoke about their embodied experience and involvement with the community kitchen and how it helped them to understand bigger picture issues relating to the kind of socioeconomic system, social inequality, environmental justice, etc. Um, and so I think this is a really interesting uh, quote to draw on here, a quote from Lorna. 
And she says, I think early on when I was involved in the community kitchen and went to pop-ups, we used to get shown films about what the community kitchen do, which I found really useful, in fact, really motivating. They have lots of statistics that are just sort of mind-blowing. I guess that was another key motivation for getting involved. There are these big scale food waste stats that you can't really even think of what that means in practice. But yeah, doing the collections, sort of like the trailers and trailers full of food we collected from what is six or seven stores in the neighborhood on one morning, it just, and she starts to laugh, is that much and that's such a minuscule portion of the city, yet alone the rest of the country. Or yeah, it's crazy when food waste is talked about as an issue, I feel that most of the information I get is as a consumer. And you realize a lot of the problem, the majority, I think, it is, it is that most is wasted before it even gets to the supermarket or at the supermarket level. So you just come to realize that actually the problem is much far further up the chain than you realize. So I think this quote kind of demonstrates a couple of things. First of all, um, it demonstrates how the initial kind of caring about the environmental issue of food waste through watching these films motivated Lorna to act to get invo involved at the local level. But then the kind of embodied experience in the local level, so she's kind of collecting all this food, loading it onto trailer, trailers, cy cycling it across the city, um, kind of enabled her to make connections and understand kind of general bigger picture, picture issues, which she talks about at the end when she says, you come to realize that actually the problem is much further up the chain than you realize. Um, and so this idea of kind of connecting the local to the general through embodied experience this is also um, kind of central to how um, the community kitchen teach about food waste issues. Um, so they, they often take this kind of Im embodied approach when they're explaining um, the environmental um, and social issues connected to what the community kitchen does. They focus on uh, kind of giving children an embodied experience. So they spend often a lot of time rooting through kind of surplus boxes of um, fruit and vegetables and, and getting messy, washing them, cutting off the dirty bits, etc. Um, but I also wanted to draw on... Um, this quote in which Anna is talking about a game that the community kitchen designed um, that's kind of created for educational events and it's based on the game Twister. I don't know if you're familiar with the white mat and the dots and you spin a wheel and, and you ha designated a colour and you have to put a different limb on a different colour. Um, so it was based on that just to give you a bit of context. Um, so she says, we made a game called Twisted which showed the unsustainability of the food system. It was a world map and there were spots for each, over each country in the globe from where different food came from. One was a lamb, for example, from New Zealand, pineapples from South America or whatever it was. And you spun the wheel and kind of ended up in knots and then collapsed because that's what happens in the food system or what will happen in the food system. It was a good game because on lots of levels it could be received by different people. So very small children could play it as Twister and you wouldn't really know what was going on but you could still access it but as you go up the years, you can explain it a lot more and you can think about the questioning and what's going on around it. Um, so again, we kind of have this idea of um, through this kind of embodied experience of, of playing the game, kind of understanding these more general systemic issues. Okay, so I, I finally, I wanted to kind of pick up um, on something that Mary also spoke about, this idea of care as a form of resistance. Um, so I mentioned earlier on that many volunteers ident identified the activities and practices of the community kitchen as part of a kind of broader um, political agenda that seek to resist and, and challenge the atomization and individualism of society and the kind of moral logic of the market and the idea that we behave and relate to people through these kind of market principles um, and the idea of the individual as kind of self-interested and utility maximizing. Um, so I wanted to just draw on this um, quote finally from, from Sophie to demonstrate this and also to demonstrate the idea of care as a practice of hope as well. Um, so I asked Sophie, can you talk about what you believe to be the role of the community kitchen? And Sophie says, well, it comes at the end of a long line of terrible problems and we just kind of mop up a bit at the bottom and try to tell everybody about all these problems that are going on. Which sounds like a drop in the ocean. It sounds like, like what's the point? But actually, in that little drop, there is a lot going on. 
and it is, cha it is changing attitudes on a really small scale, and it is showing people what the problem is, which is often hidden because we don't really see the fields of carrots that get wasted or the people in other countries who have no land and things like that. So it feels small, but it's, um, it's kind of opening people's eyes, I suppose, to those things and also giving people food who need it and trying to, it doesn't address poverty in any way at all, but it does help in the immediate to help people to, to have a meal that day and to meet somebody else and become a little bit less isolated. It doesn't deal directly with separation, the problem with separation or isolation in a society or individualistic attitudes and stuff, but it does have a little bit of help in that way there was somewhere for people to go, to start changing that. It's kind of a starting point for lots of things, a spark. Yeah, something positive in a whole sea of crap, which is really nice. <laughs> um, so I think as well as kind of demonstrating these kind of care activities as a form of resistance, as she says, to kind of individualistic attitudes, I think this, all, this quote also represents the idea of kind of care as a, as a practice um, of hope and relating to um, in, Esther in, uh, in Esther King's description um, of, of care as being a central part of care being um, the idea of hope and the idea that we can change society and the way people relate to one another in the natural environment. Um, so yeah, that's everything. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much both for very interesting, very caring presentations. Um, I have a question for Mary. You've mentioned that there's no one but multiple ecofeminisms. And so I was wondering whether you could talk about that a bit more. And also you've mentioned the things they agree on. So the things they agree on. Yeah. So you could talk about the things they don't agree on. sort of, you know, the social clarity, because there's big overlaps between these, but, but you have the sort of eco-feminists like Val Plumwood and Karen Warren, who tend to be um, academics um, and environmental philosophers, who see, um, who very much take the kind of approach that I've been talking about um, in my presentation. So they would see things like um, gender as being the social construction, you know, all the kinds of things that we're really familiar with. You then have um, another group of eco-feminists who very much saw, um, who saw that women had a kind of innate relationship with nature, which of course is deeply, deeply problematic, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, so there were those kinds of eco-feminists, and they split off, if you like, into two little groups. You had, you had one group that um, saw a kind of eco-feminist spirituality, if you like, um, and an eco-feminist spirituality was all around kind of like Earth Mother, Mother Earth Goddess, ancient religions, very, very much drew on, uh, it was particularly an, an American thing, and particularly drew on sort of first people's culture and first people's religion, um, which again is also deeply, deeply problematic. <laughs> um, and then the final group of ecofeminists um, are more aligned to the first lot in that they see the kinds of problems that are caused by things like climate change impacting more on women because of the material, cultural, economic position of women in the world than they do on men. So if you look at, say, um, countries in sub-Saharan Africa, which are becoming um, prone to desertification, increasing drought, that kind of thing, the burden of all of that falls, tends to fall on women because women are the farmers, women do the farm work. Um, so therefore, you know, if the wells dry up and they've got to work, walk five miles or ten miles to find water and they can't grow their vegetables and the men have all left because they can't have a living on the land anymore and go to the cities, um, then the burden of that is actually, is actually falling more on women. So it's a group that sees 
these things as being, you know, having a material impact on, a greater material impact on women's lives than they do on men's. And there's some actually some really kind of interesting statistics about not only insidious things like desertification, but stuff like um, tsunamis, which I know aren't directly caused by climate change or anything like that. But the Boxing Day tsunami in, was it 2004, 2000, whenever it, well, in Aceh, you know, that was, which was devastated, hugely, I can't remember off the top of my head, but it's something like 70% of all deaths were deaths of women. And that was because of things like um, they couldn't run away because they had babies and they had elders, or they can't swim, or they didn't want to run away because it wasn't acceptable for them to be outside of the home. And then if in the aftermath of that as well, you know, girl children were not being sent to school and were, because they didn't have mothers, they weren't not being sent to school because they didn't have mothers, but because they didn't have mothers, they were far more likely to fall prey to things like traffickers than, um, than boy children. So that's the kind of, that's an overview of the, the differences. And I guess, the place where you'd say you could see the main difference was this thing about, you know, uh, women having an innate relationship with nature and the earth, which, as I said, you know, it's like deeply, deeply problematic. A problem running on from that is that um, around, I mean, ecofeminism reached a sort of zenith around the turn of the century. So you had a lot of people identifying as ecofeminists and write I mean there were masses of ecofeminist books and articles and conferences I mean big conferences where you'd have 2,000 people turning up in the states um, but for various reasons um, the kind of the innate connection with the with the planet earth got really sort of hyped up a lot of it by other feminists who um, really attacked eco-feminism for being, you know, essentialist, which I guess you could argue those bits of it sort of are, really. Um, but eco-feminism as a whole got branded, got tarnished with this thing about essentialism. And it got to the stage where a lot of people didn't want to say they were eco-feminists anymore. So you've got things like feminist environmentalist or... But it's, it's making a comeback, because I think it was... <laughs> I think it's something that was not exactly before its time, but I think a lot of those old arguments around essentialism have moved on. I think, you know, feminists in general, you know, we've got the rise of stuff like material feminism and the focus on the body. So all of that means that a lot of the sorts of things that um, ecofeminists were talking about, you know, a lot of those arguments are, are in the past now. And uh, people like Neve Moore talks about how even essentialism was sort of, um, or critiques of essentialism are in themselves to a certain extent essentialist. So, so yeah, a lot of those kind of arguments have, have moved on and ecofeminism is becoming, you know, because I think a lot of the things that it talks about are just so spot on in terms <coughs> of the issues that are facing us um, that I think it's having a bit of a revival. So, as you can see, I mean, you know, from a thing organised like this, this wouldn't have happened five, six, seven years ago. Just wouldn't. So, another question over here, I believe. Hi. Um, so, where you're saying that uh, eco-feminism has moved on, sort of from the essentialist disagreement and critique, I just was a little confused. In your talk, you had mentioned how we should recognise how we're connected but still different and like um, otherness was seemed to be a key in what you were talking about. Is that different than what? And where is that? Uh, that seems sort of it could be essentialist and that we have like the predefined identity and that we're different. Uh, no, I don't, it's not a predefined identity. I think it's a recognition that um, human beings are part of a wider ecology. I mean, we are also organic beings, but to say that um, I am the same as a tree or I am the same as, 
I don't know, even, even a gorilla or a, a higher primate, is to deny the fact that actually, you know, I'm denying the gorilla's difference. I'm denying the tree's difference. I mean, there are differences which we should celebrate rather than just saying we're all part of some amorphous mass that's part of the same thing. It's about, you know, embracing and celebrating our difference but still saying that it doesn't matter that we're different, we all still have inherent value. So it's about celebrating difference, but also celebrating the inherent value of us all. Thank you, Thank you very much for two really interesting talks. I just wanted to ask Alice um, the, about the, um, the community kitchen. Mm. Um, you didn't particularly mention any sort of gender differences in the roles that you found yeah. or in, in the clients or the volunteers or was that something that you looked at or in terms of feminism or eco-feminism? No, I, I didn't. Um, I, I kind of decided, I decided not to, but there are, I mean, there are gender, there are gender differences. There are probably more um, men and in particularly young men um, that, that come as guests but actually I would say I would say with the volunteers um, it's probably an equal mix um, and I deliberately didn't want to look at kind of women's experiences in the community kitchen because the kind of care ethics that I'm looking at that emerged from the likes of Toronto was to see care as a as a social and political practice and to kind of drag it away from the idea of it being an essentially kind of feminine trait if you, if you see what I mean Um, I mean, with people like Gilligan and Noddings, and Nell Noddings in particular, and also Sarah Ruddick, I mean, they talk um, a lot about how um, the kind of mother-child dyad should be seen as a model for care. But, um, I mean, that was the sort of thing that, I mean, we've, and others, have really wanted to move away from. And, in fact, um, people like Tronto and others say that um, other research shows that the the sort of care practices which Sarah Ruddick talks about as um, coming to the fore through the practice of mothering, they say that that actually, it's not necessarily around the practice of mothering, it's actually m quite a few subordinated groups show the same kind of ideas of looking after one another, seeing um, relationships as being important, seeing themselves as uh, something, um, a self produced in, by, in relationship to others. And Tronto also talks about, which I think is very sort of apt, that our common, the kind of common construction that people like um, Noddings and Ruddick are building on about the mother-child relationship, it is a construction, that's a social construction as well. And actually it's quite a recent thing that we look on the mother-child relationship like that. And she also, Tronto also says about how to think of um, a child being brought up just by its mother is completely erroneous as well because children are brought up by mothers, fathers, family, neighbours, schools, you know, they are, they're also in a wider network of care. It's not just mothers and children. And the final thing is that, um, is that we actually all give care we all receive care at different parts of our lives so that we are all both care givers and care receivers. So it's not, I mean, Ruddick particularly says it's, you know, we can learn from this hierarchical relationship between mother and child. Well, again, I just, I think that's a big mistake. I mean, I think it's non-hierarchical. We are all the same. We, you know, we all give and receive care at different points. And in fact, most life forms do. Yeah, I suppose so. And I think, you know, I if we're really going to look at eco-feminist ethics of care as a kind of truly transformative um, practice and alternative way of being and relating, then it, yeah, it needs to be something that everybody is, is capable of. And that's a, a, a kind of feminist, political feminist thing in itself, I mm. suppose. Mm. <laughs> thank you. That's a good question. <laughs> Uh, thank you both. This was really interesting. Uh, my question's more for Alice. 
I was wondering if um, your method is in any way mm. restricting you from applying a more critical lens to these activities mm -hmm. of the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So in the sense that, for example, you mentioned the sort of inclusivity of mm -hmm. the kitchen. Mm -hmm. However, there seems to be like a clear separation between the volunteers and the guests. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if that's, first of all, by choice or like why are the guests not participating? Yeah. Why is not everybody like cooking okay. in that sense? Good question. So perhaps I should have explained that a little bit more. Um, so m yeah, maybe I gave the idea that they were these two distinct entities, mm -hmm. but actually, you know, they're really not. And a lot of the kind of long-standing volunteers, the guests, and a lot of the um, volunteers that come and cook will also, when they're not cooking, they'll come to the community mm -hmm. meal. So they're they're not kind of clear clear cut categories. But in response to your kind of first part of the question, um, yes. I, 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 see, I see what you're what you're kind of asking, um, but I, I think that participatory approaches mm. and, and and kind of being involved and collaborating also provides a different insight. Um, and I don't necessarily believe that you can kind of entirely stand back from your research and have this kind of. I'm not saying that you're saying that, but the, the, you know the, the kind of positivist idea of you know in, you have to be a kind of neutral observer or whatever. I don't I don't really buy into that mm. perspective. Um, so yeah, does that answer your? I m more was thinking like around. So for example, in the issue of food waste, yeah, because right? there is a l I see a lot of potential in transformation. My mm. research is on something similar as mm. well. But like, what I'm thinking about mm. in terms of this is, would it not make a larger impact mm -hmm. if it engaged with like, say, the neoliberal paradigm by mm -hmm. lobbying like throughout global value like value chains yep. about food waste and changing the food culture like what's yep. happening in France and supermarkets mm -hmm. with the fruit that doesn't get chosen and yet mm -hmm. is not discarded so don't you think that something like that could potentially be more transformative within the power you know what I mean Does that makes sense yeah I mean I guess the, the the kind of point I made at the end about the, the kind of uh, engaging differently through a kind of different ethic to the market is transformative in itself. But I think like a lot of the volunteers that I spoke to were very aware of the criticisms of community kitchens that are kind of paired with or coupled with supermarkets because, you know, you then get used as part of their kind of corporate social responsibilities spin. Um, there's been all sorts recently in the news about Morrisons and, and, and farmers, etc. Um, but where was I going with this? Uh, so yeah, so the volunteers are kind of very aware that they're kind of standing at the back end of this kind of capitalist system and, and, and catching the waste and also the kind of tensions around um, c kind of sustaining that system in a way as well as kind of trying to challenge it. So there's, there's definitely all sorts of tensions there that people spoke about. Um, and also that I'm definitely kind of g going to address in, in my research. Cool, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Um, I had a very interesting conversation on the train coming up with a, with a friend of mine who's actually an academic at the University of Gloucester and he does do things about food. And he was hoping to be here today, but he couldn't. And we were talking about, he, he was saying how if all you're doing is um, being an activist who's like against things and criticizing corporations and all of that sort of stuff, then actually, where is change going to come from? Which I think is a really good point. But all I can say is we're running out of time. You know, we haven't got you know, we haven't got time to hope that by slowly picking away at what big corporations are doing, we're going to, we're going to rescue the planet, because it hasn't happened since, well, how long ago is 1995? 20-odd years. We're really not much further forward. But I guess it has to be both things. I mean, I guess that there has to be those kind of people who are good at going and talking to corporations and getting them to change. And the we mean business people who say that, um, you know, it's, um, it's an economic, how can we gain economic value out of this sort of stuff? then fair enough, they, can, they should con can continue to do that because none of those things I was talking about, I don't think any of it is evil or wrong, it's just that it's not enough. And therefore, at the same time as having those more kind of persuasive tactics, I think you need the things like um, the community kitchen and other stuff that's not 
around food, renew community renewable energy projects, all of those kinds of things which are trying to build something alternative from the ground up. So it's a pincer movement. But, you know, in my heart, I'm far more interested in the radical bits than I am in going and talking to a bunch of CEOs. I'll leave that to other people to do. So. Thanks. Um, this is a question for Alice. And I'm actually, um, I think as you explain it, so the community kitchen is kind of like a roving kitchen. So it, it, it kind of goes to different community centers. Um, is that so right? It's based in one community center, but it okay. also has kind of pop-up events and attends kind of other kind of food waste, environmental, social justice events. Okay. So it is, it, it does have a regular um, meal once a week, but then it does also kind of move around. So okay. it's kind of fluid and... Okay, because I was just <laughs> thinking about potential sort of how the mobility or, you know, the different sites, um, mm. how that affects sort of the, because you were mentioning how one of your, one, I think someone that you interviewed was talking about the space and how it was mm. a really key part of um, building connections. So yeah. if you kind of have a little bit more mobility, like how that would affect it. And yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, that kind of movement and geography is really interesting because, um, so the events that they do outside of the, um, community centre kind of range from very different locations so for example they might do some uh, so kind of um, at a university they might do some kind of on the other side of town in a kind of very wealthy affluent neighbourhood um, but I think I yeah it's very interesting because the, I think the reason why they choose to, to do that and to be in more affluent places providing these community meals is to kind of create awareness um, and to kind of almost be like a conduit into kind of people getting engaged with kind of social environmental justice mm. stuff, if, you s if, that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm. Okay. And I just have one more question, mm. I guess it's just out of the, because there was quite a few um, issues that the community kitchen uh, wanted to address. So you mm. said, I think, food waste, food poverty, fuel poverty, and there yeah. was one other one. And I'm just curious about how sort of, I if there's, if if you noted any sort of um, sort of discussion around trying to focusing on one aim versus yeah. four aims, I mean, it seems like it does address all four, and it's yeah. kind of like, do you, I mean, I think maybe it's part of the whole ecofeminist approach is just mm. embracing that complexity and say, yeah, we're going to address all four or five yeah. or six issues um, rather than just one. Or yeah, did you yeah, that's a really good question. So it's definitely a response to the context of that time. So, for example, there were quite a lot of refugees and asylum, seek and asylum seekers coming at one point because there was a new kind of refugee community centre opened up mm -hmm. locally. Um, and so, actually, in responding to that context, they decided because they would they were trying to get more refugees and asylum seekers because they knew that, that a lot of them were kind of living in in in, in food poverty. Um, and they realised that they, they weren't sure where the community centre was. The refugee organisation kind of perhaps hadn't communicated it properly or perhaps um, the people that wanted to come perhaps couldn't read English or they couldn't read a map. So they started doing a walk um, just before the community meal kind of through that part of the city to the community centre. So that kind of tapped into to that kind of demographic. But then, I mean, I think definitely... Um, that there's definitely been a change recently. There are more particularly um, kind of single parents coming that are struggling with the, the cuts to welfare. So there's been a kind of response there and they'll um, kind of put posters in uh, local community centres or, or events um, that um, that demographic often attends. So I think it's definitely that thing of responding to context, responding to need, which kind of connects to that eco-feminist ethic of care and the idea of it being a kind of context approach. Mm. Sorry, another question. Um, I work in food policy oh. and I just wondered if you're aware there's quite a lot of work that's critical of these kind of projects mm. as from the aspect of food poverty and from thinking about these kind of projects that use food waste and people's right to food and whether using food waste is an appropriate thing to do for people in, in food poverty and whether yeah. that then tends to replace welfare and 
did that some, is that something that came up in your research? Yeah, all the time. Um, so people, it was really interesting actually, people kept on, or the people I spoke to, the volunteers kept on drawing on these amazing metaphors of like, you know, we're, we're essentially a sticking plaster. Um, somebody else said it's like um, fighting a house fire with a water pistol. Kind of all these metaphors recognizing um, that this, the, the kind of systemic issue is, is much bigger. Um, and yes, we, there's definitely been um, kind of conversations about the idea of, you know, um, kind of using food waste from supermarkets, etc. Um, but I think, you know, that's part, you know, it is an inclusive meal and, and, and everybody does eat the meal. There's no, you know, it's really about trying to kind of break down this barrier between the volunteers and guests in the kitchen. Um, so... You know, in that sense, I think that, you know, it is food that nourishes people and the, the food that we get is often, I mean, there's absolutely nothing, particularly the food from the supermarkets. It's kind of, you know, you can eat it kind of three or four days later and actually uh, there's a donations table often so people can take food home and eat it, you know, whenever they want to. That's kind of part of, of what the community kitchen does as well. The whole thing about food banks is really difficult, isn't it? Mm. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, it really is mm. a conundrum because mm. you can see how food banks have become an almost accepted part of, you know, the government's rhetoric on, well, this is the big society working. You know, it doesn't matter that we've, you know, sanctioned people for being 15 minutes late because the bus was late. You know, they can go to the food bank. But I don't know, what's the alternative? You just do nothing? You, have, you know, it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, can, can we not do both? Yeah. I think one of the things that I struggle with is you use the metaphor of fighting a house fire with a water pistol. What if because you're fighting it with a water pistol, the fire department says, oh, they've got that under control. We don't need to bother to even go there and help. Mm -hmm. So I think that if it is certainly an act of, I mean, of course, resistance and hope, of course, mm -hmm. but I don't know that it is is fixing, well, it's certainly not fixing anything. Is it, I, I, I don't, I struggle with that. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that contradiction kind of was acknowledged by several people that I um, interviewed and, yeah, the, the, you know, this kind of sticking plaster metaphor and, and I think that, that I think that she touches on it a little bit in the in the last quote that you know they're not actually they're not actually making a they're not actually directly addressing poverty, um, but they're kind of on a small scale trying to kind of change attitudes and change the way we see people, our perceptions of people, um, and kind of trying to change the way we relate to each other in society and thinking about kind of responsibility and reciprocity and kind of all of these issues. So. I guess, I mean, I don't, I don't have a, a, an answer, um, but it was a theme that, that, that kind of came up in the interviews, if that. I'm afraid to say that I think um, even, if so, even if somebody wasn't squirting the water pistol on it, um, the fire department would be looking the other way anyway, so. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. I mean, I think, you know, what's happening in terms of benefit cuts and sanctions is absolutely inhuman, and I think you know, if it wasn't for food banks and things like the community kitchen, I think actually you would just have people starving, quite honestly. I mean, I, I don't think having the food bank there stops the government or, you know, it's, I just think it's inhuman. I think, I think also, not all of the volunteers, but some of the volunteers that um, got involved spoke quite extensively about how um, it kind of sparked a more kind of radical perspective and they w um, went on to kind of engage in more radical kind of environmental and social justice issues. So, you know, I, I, it can kind of act as a conduit, conduit into that, not always, but some people did speak about, about that as well. Um, yeah. I was just going to say that the whole the food banks thing is clearly mm. that food banks are 
are wanting to expand. Mm. So you have that kind of whole contradiction. And then I, I don't know whether the community kitchen that you were talking about was part became part of this bigger. Mm. I thought that was really interesting, actually, yeah. aspects of your research when they sort of started to say, well, I'm not sure we want to really be corporatized by yeah. this bigger national um, charity, which kind of mm. can take away some of that, then that kind of local embodied practice that, yeah. that you were talking about. So that's kind of quite interesting, the corporatization of food banks and whether the government then see it as a kind of smaller smaller government response. Mm. They can take away welfare and get the supermarkets to work with the food banks and hey presto, it's, you know, we've yeah. solved everything. We've solved waste food, we've solved poverty. Yep. And yet are people getting, are they ending up eating tins of beans that are not necessarily nutritious mm. for them? Mm. Uh, their right to food means that they have to go begging to a food bank for people's leftovers. Yep. So there's all those issues, but it's, yep. you know, it's really interesting that you've looked at it and yeah. researched it and found out what those people are saying. I think also, you know, um, the community kitchen is also very different to a food bank because it f focuses on providing, in particular, a kind of nutritious meal. Um, and that's partly in response um, to uh, the kind of recent research on the idea that actually, you know, uh, people who live off food banks are not getting access to particularly nutritious food. So it's kind of a response to that kind of gap in the in the food bank as, as well as many other gaps, but specifically kind of providing a nutritious food and also through the donations table, providing kind of bundles of fruit and vegetables to take away. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, I have two more questions, one for Alice and one for Mary. So the first one is again, linked to the last question of those tensions mm -hmm. um, of getting food from Sainsbury's or from mm. whatever, whichever supermarket it is. And is the idea of having that, wanting to have that inclusivity. Mm -hmm. And I know like other community kitchens or community cafes, um, they end up buying really cheap food mm -hmm. to be able to offer a cheap food, mm -hmm. to be able to uh, have that inc social inclusivity for humans, mm -hmm. but then, so the ethics of care are for humans, but then yeah. that cheap food means the ethics of care are not covering nature because cheap yeah. food is not cheap, it's costing, mm -hmm. yeah. it's just not in the price of food. So um, that tension. And then a question for Mary. Um, that I'm not sure how to formulate. So at the last seminar, somebody from the audience made a really interesting question about how ecofeminism was kind of, um, came from white middle class women. And she m gave an example from Hawaii, I think, I'm not sure. And she mentioned, I don't think the person is here, but it was very interesting because she mentioned that she f identified with the label femi feminist. She f identified as a feminist, but not as an ecofeminist. So I was thinking feminism al also came from white middle class women, um, but it's gone through a longer journey. Um, do you think the same is going to happen with ecofeminism? Do are we too still too close to the white middle class origin um, of ecofeminism so that not every wo woman or fewer women see the link between uh, exploitation of nature and exploitation of women and th those links? Um, so that, yeah, and those your opinion on those cr crossing issues of um, class and ethnic background. Um, so around the kind of ethics of um, food, I, I think I think I understood what your question. What sh shall I go? Um, okay. So yeah. So kind of related. I think this is a response to what you were um, asking. So first of all, the meal at the community kitchen is free. Um, uh, I wasn't sure if I mentioned that in my presentation. I think I did at the beginning. Um, but uh, one of the kind of issues around kind of what foods, processed foods, what kind of foods do we use, where do they come from, um, is around meat. Um, and there's been like quite extensive discussions about kind of serving meat or not serving meat. And there's uh, kind of the firm opinion overall uh, that it should be a vegetarian um, meal and some people want to make it a, a, a vegan meal for kind of ethical issues relating um, to animals and animal cruelty. Um, but th then, you know, there's also the argument that this um, 
you know, the meat and other foods that have been incredibly uh, costly in terms of resource-wise to produce are being thrown away and not being used. So there's kind of also that tension there. But I think what's really interesting is that um, in these kind of embodied practices of preparing the food, these things are always spoken about and talked about kind of from different perspectives and constantly kind of negotiated and contested. And that, you know, there have been times um, when, for example, we've had a huge amount of goat's cheese um, that has come through with a load of vegetables and should, should that be used? And uh, some people arguing that it shouldn't be used because it's a dairy product for ethical reasons and other people saying, well, no, we're going to throw it in a bin so it must be used. So all those kind of tensions and contradictions absolutely play out very regularly in the, in the community kitchen. So that's I don't have necessarily an answer, but those contradictions are acknowledged and, and they're alive and spoken about a lot. Yeah, the, I mean, yes, there was very much the criticism along with the um, essentializing one about how eco-feminism, like probably most feminism back in the 1980s, 1990s, was a white middle-class movement. Um, I mean, there were, and, and worse than that in a way, a white middle class movement that idealized and romanticized um, things like, for example, I talked about the first, first people's practices. Um, there was a lot of idealization of something called the Chipko movement in India, which was supposedly something to do with women hugging trees to stop them being chopped down, and that was branded as, you know, an eco-feminist piece of activism, whereas the Chipko women would never have heard of eco-feminism. So there was a lot of that sort of criticism about how eco-feminism appropriated some of these things and romanticized it along the way. So I think the modern, or the more, the modern, what horrible way of putting it, the more recent um, people who've become interested are far more aware of all of that because again it's like you know feminism has moved on from the 1980s and 1990s so those sorts of things were uh, they weren't paid sufficient attention to by any kind of feminist you want to mention so that kind those that kind of ideas around intersectionality and, and stuff around ethnicity and race and class and and ableism um, have come much more to the fore in feminism generally. So, I mean, you've got, you've, I mean, you can always point to eco feminists who aren't white and middle class, like Vandana Shiva. Well, she might be middle class, but she's not white. I'm trying to think of current people. I mean, certainly, I run a, I've been running a stream at the Gender Work and Organization Conference um, for the last ooh, six years, and we have women from Indonesia and we have you know women of color who are western women of color i don't think i'm i am a bit middle class but i'm from south london you can probably tell so <laughs> so we're not all posh whiteos <laughs> <laughs> yeah i just i just think that the the appreciation, the understanding of those sorts of issues has developed hugely over the last 20 or 30 years in feminism in general. So. I, I have one. Um, I wondered what you thought the role or place or whether you even think it's involved of uh, kind of emotional labour. Um, fits in with with activism because there is a bit of research around the emotional labor of, of caring um and so on and i know you were talking about a different you're theorizing is a different type of care but um yeah i mean there is there is some research about the, the very real costs that and mm -hmm. toll that that um mm -hmm. takes particularly particularly on women mm -hmm. so i wondered i guess it's a question for both of you what you like to speak I don't think either of us deny that caring, mm. caring well, and being cared for, mm. <laughs> it's very hard work. Mm. So, yeah. Mm. But, I mean, I think we would also both say that it shouldn't be an emotional toll that just falls on women. Yeah, so, yeah. 
but it is it is very very hard work and the kind of um you know the sort of negotiations that alice has been talking around about you know whether they should throw the goat's cheese out or or keep it is i mean that's it's i'm you know i'm not kind of meaning to trivialize it but that's just symptomatic of the kind of hard work that goes into the sorts of negotiations around you know what care is and what a caring practice is and, and how do we work this out in our lives and in what we do so i think yeah it is hard work and i don't and i think we should not confuse it with the kind of emotional labor that you get in org studies which is uh, air hostesses smiling that's so you probably don't know that body of work there's a huge body of work around emotional labor which is to do with you know people on checkouts looking cheerful and call center operatives smiling when they talk to you and actually how dreadful that is and how really really exploitative and hard work that is so so yeah but yeah definitely um yeah it's some definitely something so in one of the um, workshops that i ran with the community kitchen team i don't know if this is working or is it um oh sorry it is <laughs> Okay, um, so in, in one of the workshops, one of the kind of themes that came out in the workshop was um, kind of stress, I think it was like stress limits burn burnout or something was this kind of title of this this work, uh, this particular part of the workshop and, and where people kind of spoke about um, the, the, challenge, the challenges of being in the community kitchen and, and hearing actually like some really harrowing, awful um, stories of kind of what people have experienced and, and, and kind of learning a bit of a back, as a kind of background around, you know, other, other volunteers and other guests as well. Um, so that is something that's kind of spoken about and, and, and addressed and it's definitely something um, that you know that, it, that there's like some sharing that takes place definitely in the in the kind of I uh, regular meetings and and kind of this kind of process of checking in with those issues and but that's kind of part of it and there are definitely people I spoke to one person who she described it as a kind of burn burnout because there was a particular incident that that happened um, with one guest a very tragic incident um so y yeah there's there's kind of no way of, of that they try to deal with those issues, but they're, they're very much present. Mm. Yeah. And was your sense that they were quite equally shared amongst all the volunteers? Um, yeah, I think s uh, I'm not. I'm not really sure. I know. So I'm just thinking particularly of kind of um, one participant who spoke about um, being involved when the community kitchen was recently um, kind of set up, and they're and they're kind of being. Um, you know a, a kind of space created to d to discuss those issues and 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 how to kind of address them and i think again this kind of thing of uh, responding to context as 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 well when these issues arise um, arose i spoke to somebody who worked at the um community center who who was really struggling um to deal um with one um a uh, guest who had Asperger's and was kind of had quite problematic behaviour and I think slightly aggressive. Um, and they spoke about how they got together and discussed this and decided that the best way was to kind of draft up a, a particular kind of policy that was especially for this person that attended to kind of his needs um, uh, and kind of issues. So it, it wasn't just applying this kind of universal policy around kind of safe space or whatever that was actually rejected and another one was drawn up specifically for this context um, and I know that they contacted the Asperger's Society to kind of get so I think th these kind of problems and issues that arise are definitely often from my understanding dealt with in a, in a kind of team um, and and spoken about in a kind of emotional way and not just in a kind of rational rational way if that's <laughs> well, I think we might have drawn to our natural conclusion. Thank you again, Alice and Mary. We've